Graphic translation is a common process that we use as designers, and it's maybe the part of our profession that people know the most about. This is often the process of creating logos, marks, and icons, and will be an important process for you to understand for your career as a designer. Graphic translation is the process of abstracting, simplifying, and stylizing an object from the real world. The outcome should be a simple and easily recognizable symbol or mark that represents accurately the original real world object. Simplification is the process of making something simpler. This allows it to be easier to understand and recognize. Oftentimes abstraction is used in conjunction with the concept of simplification, but not always. So simplification is where we take a complex object, maybe a photograph like we will in this assignment, and we look at how can we simplify and take elements out of that object, but still have it be recognizable and also work in a more graphic context. Abstraction is the process of reducing something down to its most basic form in simple shapes. It helps us communicate a large amount of information through the simplest shapes possible. So abstraction is similar to simplification in that we are simplifying, but abstraction is actually going to change the way that an object is rendered and abstract it to help in that simplification process. So they're related, but they're not quite the same thing. And we'll look at some examples down the line. The last one is stylization. Stylization is the addition of style or reference to your work. It can also aid in simplification or abstraction, but it is more about the mood or style of the object or mark. This can reference a certain style such as Art Deco, or it can be decorative and not based on a specific style or period. This is where we sometimes change the way something looks, render it in a certain way to make it reference something specific. So it can be a period like Art Deco or Art Nouveau or constructivism, but sometimes it's just referencing something else. Maybe it's a certain style of architecture that your logo is gonna appear on. Maybe it's potentially referencing something stylistically related to a culture that it relates to. So stylization is almost a decorating of the abstraction and simplification process that gives it a little bit more meaning. Here's an interesting example. This is a cicada, and we're seeing these stages of simplification and abstraction. This is actually from 1905 from a magazine called Ceramic Studio. This was done by Hugo Froelich, and you can see that as we go from A to J, there's a process of simplifying and abstracting that happens. And this is very similar to the process that you will be using on this assignment. We're gonna start with rendering something very realistic or as realistic as we can. And then we're gonna slowly look at how can we simplify and how can we abstract that in order to find that sweet spot. Where is that spot where we have something that is abstracted and simplified and still recognizable as the original object, but we haven't gone so far that someone wouldn't be able to identify what we're looking at. So I think in this one, J is a good example. We've gone much too abstract with J. I think if you didn't see A through H, you wouldn't know that that's a cicada. And so I think that's an example where maybe something like F or G are a better sweet spot in this situation. They're simplified, they're abstracted, they're more symbol based, but they're still identifiable as the cicada itself. Here's another piece from a famous book called Understanding Comics. This is by Scott McCloud. He's from Boston, Massachusetts. And he's using this in his book, Understanding Comics, to talk about the process of abstracting. So here he's showing this same process, but with someone's face. So on the left, we have a photograph of someone's face, and then he's showing how you can strip down the image to get to something that is more simple, which is something we would see in a comic book. He also talks about finding those essential meanings, right? Finding those specific details that are important that helps you identify this specific person that you wanna amplify and use that can make something even more recognizable. Here's another professional example of this. This is the Shell logo evolution. The current version we see down there on the lower right is by Raymond Lowy, but a lot of other people have worked on this project. So when Shell was first founded in 1900, you can see in the upper left that there's a shell that was used to represent this company, but I think a lot of us would have a really hard time identifying that as a shell. Part of it is the angle that we're looking at it. You can notice between 1900 and 1904, they put the shell upright, they shoot it straight on, which immediately really helps us understand more what we're looking at and that this is an actual shell. 
So this is something important to think about. As you're working on this project, you get to select the image that you'll use. And it can be really helpful to select something that's a little bit more iconic, that's maybe shot more straight on. You wanna select the photo carefully that you translate from because it might make it easier to create something that's recognizable at the end. So if you can imagine, if you started with a shell that's photographed like the first one at 1900, you're setting yourself up to not be that successful. And that was really solved in the 1904 version and carried out all the way through the modern day version of this logo where they picked a different source material that is gonna set them up to be more successful to have this be recognizable as a shell. But then I also think it's interesting as you look at all of these evolutions, how this has slowly been simplified and abstracted over time to the logo that we know today. It slowly erodes away some of the information to make something that's even more graphic. If you look from 1948 to 1955, you can see that they're really cleaning things up. They're really making the lines more intentional. They're getting rid of some of that noise and some of that more illustrative quality to make something that's more of a vector-oriented mark. And then I love the 1961 and the ones that follow where they're actually making it work better in one color. And then eventually we could say that it might be hard to identify as a shell if we didn't know that this company was shell and they hadn't been using this logo for over a hundred years. But through time and repetition, they've allowed us to really understand that that abstract shape with those radiating lines represents a shell. It's a great example of seeing this process over time. And sometimes this happens with logos. Although for this assignment, we really wanna set you up for success from the beginning so that we can create something that's a little bit more successful, abstracted, simplified, but also identifiable. Here's a professional designer's process that I wanted to show. This is Mark Blaustein. He works in New York City, and this is for the New York Public Library rebrand. So this was a rebrand of the entire New York Public Library. And it's an interesting project because they started with one of the statues that's in front of the main branch of the New York Public Library, it's near Bryant Park in Manhattan, and it's these lion sculptures. And you can see that he is taking a photograph of that lion and he's blocked out the space around its head. He shot it from a certain angle. And then he works on a little bit of a process that we are going to do in this class. He's posterizing and thresholding that photo to see light and dark. And then you can see that he starts actually drawing the lion. So he's looking at drawing it exactly how he sees it. And initially, it's a little bit hard to identify. The shapes don't have good gestalt. There's not good cohesion between the pieces, which makes it hard to identify. So he continues that process. And you can see here something very similar to what we will be doing. He starts shooting it from a different angle or identifying it from a different angle. He starts cropping it differently, which you can see in the top middle. He starts actually putting it in a circle, which gives it stronger gestalt. He also explores other angles, like a complete profile in the lower right but eventually settles on this lower angle that's really working well and gives it a little bit more of a dignified traditional look. Then you can see that process all the way to the lower right with that final logo that they still use today. The other thing that's interesting about this logo is the way it's used. I love these tote bags on the left where they're able to blow up the logo and crop it on that tote bag to just show the face, but it's still really recognizable. And then I also think the right is interesting where the logo works really small because one of the reasons why we go through that simplification and abstraction process is we don't always know where these logos and marks are going to live. And oftentimes there's situations where they're going to be this small. That logo is tiny. You can see it next to that fingernail that it is just absolutely tiny, but it's still identifiable and it still works. And that's where a lot of the value of abstraction and simplification comes in. When things are correctly simplified, correctly abstracted, they can really work in a lot of scenarios where that logo might appear, which is really vital to the success of a logo. Here's some other examples. These are some leaf studies. These are just studies by an artist where they're looking at different ways to abstract and simplify a leaf. Some of these maybe aren't really identifiable as a leaf any longer, but you can see that process and just the variety that you can create as you explore that process of abstracting, simplifying, and in some case here, stylizing. In the upper right, there is a little bit of stylization happening where they're putting these kind of checkerboard plus symbols inside of the leaf. That would be an example of stylization but it's just great to see the variety. So as you're working on this, we really encourage you to explore a lot of different ways to simplify and abstract, but we do want you to start with something that's more realistic and slowly work towards something that's more stylized and abstract. And that again will help us find that sweet spot. Here's some fish as well. These are done with cut paper, which is kind of an interesting concept. That really helps you focus on positive negative space. It also helps you work in one color. On this assignment, we're only gonna work in black and white, and that's really vital because good logos should work in black and white. 
chances are there will be a scenario where color will not be able to be used. Maybe they sponsor a marathon and they are on the back of a shirt with a bunch of other logos in one color. You need to have a solution where that logo would work in that scenario. And I find by working in black and white, you'll create a logo that definitely works in one color, but I also think in the end, you'll create a stronger mark because you'll pay more attention to positive negative space and lean less on color, which can sometimes be used as a crutch to make logos successful. The only thing that's fun about these examples is the way that they're having air flow through the mark. So see the one on the right, there's sort of this wave-like shape, organic shape that runs through the middle of the fish. You'll notice this as a technique in a lot of good logos. There's pieces that don't quite connect. They're not connected through positive space, but because they're close together, we're using that concept of closure in gestalt that helps us connect these things as one piece. The middle one does that as well. So that can be another great thing to explore in this assignment. We also want to explore marks that are solid. For the most part, good marks are going to be solid and focus on fill. They're going to be shape based. We don't want marks that focus too much on line work. They're going to be weak. They're not going to work as well in small sizes. So it's really important in this assignment to think about things using shape and being filled as opposed to having line work. I think when you first start out with this process and you're working with simplification and abstraction, sometimes you'll naturally go towards that line work, but really focus on the shape, really focus on making these solid because it's really going to make a better outcome in the end. And it doesn't mean you can't start with line work and then we'll know that you're going to fill those things in as you work in the computer. But I think it's good from the outset to really think about this as a shape based exercise as opposed to line. Here's some houses, so different ways to render houses. You can see that we go through some simplification and abstraction to the point where some of these aren't really identifiable. There's also some stylization happening in the lower right too, where they're adding these circles that really aren't a part of the actual image. They're just stylizations that are being added on top. But it's a little bit of an interesting process similar to what you might do. You can also tell that the upper right one is a good example of what I was just talking about. That line based mark is not as strong or successful as the houses that are solid, particularly that upper left one. The solid shapes are much more successful. They're stronger. They'll also work better in reduction. Another reason to keep that in mind and a good example of that. But let's look at owls. So we're going to look at owls here mostly because there's a lot of great examples of owl logos and we have a lot of source material that we can look at. So here are two images of owls that I found, and these might be good examples for you to use for source material. They're shot in a way where we can see the entire body of the owl. Although the one on the right is sitting on a branch, you can still see where its legs are. You can see its tail. They're both facing the camera, which makes it a lot easier as well. The one on the left is great too, because its feet are actually spaced apart and you can see both of them. So avoid images where they're in flight at a weird angle or their head is cocked in a strange way. And you don't even have to do an animal on this. You're really welcome to choose any object you want. But I wanted to start by showing examples of good source material because these will really help you execute and do a good mark in the end on this project. So here's some examples of vintage illustrations of owls. These are both more line based, so they're not quite logo like, which is something we want to avoid. But I think you can start seeing how as you look at images, illustrations and marks that are related to owls or really anything, you'll see that they're always positioned in this way that makes them easy to identify. Again, they're facing the camera. Sometimes there's symmetry involved, like the one on the right. Sometimes that can be a really good thing. And oftentimes symmetry is created when something is facing the camera directly. Here's some work from Sarah Jane. She's a designer out of Denver, Colorado. And this is a student project that was done when she was in university to rebrand Temple University's athletics logo. They are the owls. So this was a fun team project that happened in the classroom when she was a student done in collaboration with a fairly famous designer who does a lot of athletic oriented logos and illustrated logos like this. His name's Joe Bosak. But you can see this process of looking at these owls. Here they're exploring some with the whole body at the bottom but they're also exploring some with just the head. And it's really interesting to see all of these different sketches that Sarah created. And this is very similar to what you're gonna be doing at the beginning of this assignment. Once you identify that source material, you're really gonna be working through and trying to draw a lot of different versions so that we can figure out what direction is going to be best. 
And that's very, very common in graphic design and interaction design. In anything you do, we're often gonna be creating options, looking at a lot of different ideas and then distilling that down to what the best ideas are. Oftentimes your first idea is not your best idea. Here's another student from that same class. This is Brett Sweeney. He's a designer now in New Jersey. But here's a bunch of different logo options or sketches of an owl that he's trying. And what I love about this too is some of these aren't that great. Some of these aren't recognizable as an owl. He's just exploring and trying a lot of things and I want to empower you to do that as well. But some of these are really successful. Some of these start hitting and start making sense. And sometimes it's great to sketch like this because you'll start building. You'll have a good sketch and then you'll try it again in a different way and you'll, you'll keep revising. You'll keep working on that idea and slowly over time it will get more successful. And so Brett really starts honing in on this one idea. It's more of the face. It's more of an abstraction. It's actually the second row from the bottom and it's the fourth one from the left. You'll see it's just the eyes with this sort of V-like shape and then this semicircle oval that doesn't complete that contains the head. And he pushes that further and then takes it into the computer and starts to vectorize that. He also explored other ideas which are really great too, but you can start seeing how this evolution happens. And this is another step that you'll be going through on this process. As we start identifying sketches that are successful, we're gonna bring them into computer and start exploring how we can execute them and what's the best way to execute them. And how can we make that idea better by using the computer and Adobe Illustrator to bring your idea to life. And some of these are better than others. I particularly enjoy the one on the top right or the middle row on the left where we're playing with positive negative space where there's a lot of air that's able to breathe and we have a strong concept of gestalt. But there's some other ones that are really good here too. And the exploration of the different ideas is really important. But look at these. Here's a bunch of other owl logos. These are actual logos that are in the real world, professional real logos that contain an owl. And you could just start seeing the diversity of ideas. I think it's so easy to assume that everything's been done but oftentimes there's so many different ways to abstract and simplify something or even stylize, right? Some of these are very stylized, like the lower left. That's a design studio and it's sort of an owl made out of pencils. The upper right is also fairly stylized too. That's a publishing icon. So it sort of has a book-like quality to it. So those are examples of stylization and how that can sometimes set apart what you've done. And then here's a random set of vector owls that I found by Stinia Ifani. And these are just on Vecteezy. This is something you can download and use. I mean, we could argue about which ones are really good and which ones are bad and that, that's fine. But you can just start again, seeing the variety of what's possible. There's so many ways to render an object. And I think it's easy to fall into the trap of assuming that it's already been done and how can I make this new? But I think actually part of the challenge and the fun is picking something that maybe has been done and sort of really working through this process of simplification, abstraction, and stylization to create something that's fresh and new because it's absolutely possible and it's really what we do on a regular basis as designers. Great logos have many layers of meaning. They allude to the service or business they represent without words. As you work through this assignment, you will be also tasked to explore adding more meaning to your sketches. This can come from research of the selected subject or through an arbitrary decision you will make about the use of your mark. There are many techniques that will help you in this process. So similarly to some of the logos that we looked at, those professional logos where there were pencils in the owl or there were kind of a reference to a book in the owl, sometimes when we add a double meaning, it makes logos even stronger. They become conceptual. They start having meaning beyond what the object is itself, which sometimes will allude to the business or the company that this represents. And this is something we want you to play with a little bit. It's not a requirement. You don't have to actually have your final logo have a double meaning, but in your sketches, we want you to explore this and understand these concepts. So to really talk about these three concepts of how we create meaning in a logo, I wanna look at these three owl logos. So the one on the left is a barn owl mark by Neil Burnell. He works out of the UK. The middle is an owl mark made by Madi. This is someone on social media, and it's actually a free logo that you can download from freepick.com. I just found it and it really worked well for an example in this lecture. And the right is Love Owl Logo, which is by Kenji TM. He's a designer out of Indonesia. So again, these logos are all owls and they all illustrate these different concepts and that's why I've chosen them. And the first concept is the concept of addition. Addition, or sometimes known as insertion, is when elements are combined together and become more than the elements individually. The connection between these items helps hint at the meaning or the purpose of the graphic composition. So this first barn owl I showed is a great example of that. 
there is an addition or an insertion of a key that is being held by the feet of this owl that helps us understand that there's further meaning here. Maybe we don't know exactly what that additional meaning is, but it's telling us something about maybe the keys to knowledge or the keys to a certain place. That additional icon is really helping us understand that there's more meaning to this than it just as an owl. Then we have some other examples of addition or insertion. On the far left is a logo for unlocking potential. It's also a logo where I don't quite know who the designer was, but they've used a U and a P and they've combined them and added them together in a way that makes it look like a lock and that lock is unlocking. So they're actually creating a fun play with the name of this company and then actually the way that their icon looks. Another interesting one in the middle is a pencil logo. It's done by a South African designer and we've actually added this small triangle at the bottom between the I and the L which creates the illusion that there's actually a pencil there. So the addition of this small triangle actually creates a lot of meaning, creates a beautiful positive negative space logo solution, and this illusion that there's actually a pencil there. The far right is a logo I love as well. This is by Eric Baker Design. He's a designer out of New York City, and it's for Morgan Road Books. So there's actually these M's that are woven together, but parts of them are removed, and there's an addition of these rectangular elements in the middle which sort of represents a road, a brick road of some kind, which is really creating a little bit more meaning of what the name of this company is. Another concept is substitution. Substitution is similar to addition in that something is being added to something else, but in this case, the element that's being added is being used in the place of something else. Again, this connection between these items helps hint at the meaning or purpose of the graphic composition. So that's where this one comes in, the owl and the books. So here we've actually removed the wings of the owl and we've substituted it with a book. We've even sort of taken away some of the body at the bottom of the owl to create those book pages. So there's a substitution happening here that gives us more meaning and lets us know that this is some kind of an owl logo that relates to books. Here's some other examples. The logo on the left, which is for a nonprofit called Shelter. This was done by Johnson Banks in the UK. And the H has been substituted or modified to look like a house, which relates to the kind of work this nonprofit does. The middle is a piece by Lance Wyman. He's a pretty famous American graphic designer, and this is for the Minnesota Zoo, where they've substituted the lower right part of that M and turned it into a moose head, which helps you understand that this is somehow about animals. It helps you understand that this must be related to animals, and since this is a zoo, that makes sense. The far right is an interesting one too. This is by Brian Eagle. And this is where they've taken that E and they've substituted it for a heating conduit. So it's kind of hinting at this idea of oven. There's a heating conduit that's been run through this word. It's still readable as an E. We can still read the oven, but it also enhances and gives it more meaning. The last concept we'll look at is omission. It's sometimes also known as subtraction or missing link, but it's the opposite of addition and that something is being removed to create more meaning. Sometimes removing something will make the viewer think about what is missing and fixate on the importance of that missing piece. This technique can also lead to a style-driven solution that do not increase the meaning or understanding. Sometimes this is done stylistically as a part of the stylization process. Sometimes that omission actually creates further meaning and understanding of your logo or mark. So that gets us to this one. This is where the body of the owl is actually pulled out and that negative space that's created is a heart which helps us know this has something to do with loving owls. There's some relationship between the heart and the owl. But here's some other examples. The left is an interesting one. It's the Summit logo. And this is for a building restoration company. This was done by a designer, Joseph Tehan in Dublin. And what's happening here is part of the letter forms on the right, the M, I, and T have been removed to create the illusion of a cross on a hill, which for this building restoration company sees as the highest standard. That's sort of what that means here, is they're creating this cross on a hill which alludes to this higher standard of the kind of building restoration that they do. So by omitting part of those letter forms, they're creating this illusion which is giving more meaning to that mark. The middle one's a famous example by Malcolm Greer Design. It was designed in 2000. It's for the New Bedford Whaling Museum. So there's a ship here. But that main mass, that main middle portion of the sails has been removed and in it is a shape of a whale tail. So it's sort of hinting at this idea of whaling, which is also intrinsically tied to sailing and ships. And so they've created a double meaning here through that subtraction or that omission of part of the sails to make that whale tail. The one on the right's an interesting one as well. This is for a company called Slice. 
This was done by Manual, their design firm in San Francisco, California. And this is a company that makes cutting products. So they've actually sliced the logo. They've sliced it, which really hints at this idea of making these precision cuts and using cutting tools, which are the things that they provide as a business. So these are great examples of the process of omission, how you can remove things from a logo to enhance its meaning. And these three strategies can be really useful to remember. Again, they're things we want you to explore in the sketching on this assignment, but it might not be that your final logo includes these kinds of meaning. But it's good to know and it's good to practice because it's something that is very often used in logo and mark design and something that you want to be well versed in. Let's talk about the specific assignment for this. The first step of this is to select an object and abstract it to reveal its core meaning. You want to begin with a photograph of the object or image and then explore its shape and shadows with the threshold and posterize functions in Photoshop. So these are all required phases of this project. First, you're going to pick that photo. And remember, you want to pick carefully, get the right angle, get something that's going to work well and set you up to be successful. After that, you're going to take that photo into Photoshop and you're going to play with the posterize and the threshold options in there, which will help you see light and dark. It will help you see shadow and it will help set you up to start drawing and sketching your ideas. Once you have sufficient source material, use tracing tissue, pencil and marker to graphically simplify the image in at least three different steps. So you want a level one, a level two and a level three, and those should gradually reduce it to a more abstract and simplified state. So similar to that cicada example I showed, we really want you to start more realistic and then eventually move to something more simplified and abstract. And then we'll review those sketches and determine where that sweet spot is and where we should work to execute in the computer. You wanna be sure to keep all of these steps because everything that we're talking about needs to be put in the final PDF for submission. So the original image, all of the Photoshop work, all of these sketches that you're required to do at these different levels, all of that is something that you wanna keep because it's required for grading. After you have simplified and explored abstraction of the object, begin to sketch stylizations of the simplified icon. Challenge yourself to try different line styles or rendering techniques that change the style and design of the icon. At this phase, also explore utilizing omission, substitution, and or insertion to add meaning to the icon. So once we sort of figure out that simplification abstraction, you're getting good ideas and you have some that you think are successful, we now want you to take those and play with stylization as well as adding meaning through the concepts that were introduced at the end of this lecture. So we want you to create some more options that really explore that. Remember again to focus on shape, it's really what we want here, but there's lots of ways to render shape and use omission, substitution, or insertion to create that meaning. Once those sketches are completed, you're going to post them to discussion and ultimately make a decision of the sketch or direction you would like to pursue. Then you're going to work in Illustrator to execute the sketch digitally using the pen tool and the shape tools. We have software tutorials that will help you through this entire process, but that'll be the next step and that will lead you to that final mark that you will create, that you will turn in for grading with all of the material that you did to lead up to creating that mark. There is a template for this assignment that will help you keep things organized. And here's an example from a former student. So the student selected a horse and you can see it's a great source image. The horse, you can see all of its legs. It's shot from a direct side view. You can see its head. This is setting the student up to be really successful. And then we can see that threshold in the middle and then the posterize on the right. And you can see how those really help you see light and dark. They already start to sort of simplify the image, which can make it less daunting to start to draw. As we go forward, here's some of the sketches. So we have the hand done sketches in the left and the middle. So you can see how we're starting in the upper left with something much more realistic. And then we're slowly working on simplifying and abstracting and then playing with some stylization as well. So you do need a minimum of eight sketches for this but we encourage you to do more. It can be really useful to create more sketches on this assignment to really try out different ideas. And they don't even have to be quite this polished. Like the examples I showed of the owls, they can be a little bit more simple and a little bit more gestural, but it's really valuable to explore different ideas. And again, to figure out where you wanna land in that ultimate simplification and abstraction level. Then on the right, we have the vector translation. So we want you to translate a few of these and start working on them in the computer. Sometimes it's also that you translate one and then you wanna do it again to improve it. So sometimes it's not different ideas, although that's okay to explore too, 
but we want at least a few of these done in the computer so you can explore different ideas and are also working on a revision process to improve and make your ideas better. Then at the end, we have the final mark. So this is a great example. Wonderful use of positive negative space. It's shape based. I think it's definitely still identifiable as that original image. So really great example of what we're looking for at the end of this assignment. So this can be a little bit challenging, but don't forget you can always write your instructor to get more help, get questions answered. But I think it's an important project and something that I hope you'll embrace and have fun with because it is so vital to the work that we do as designers.